Lords, I thank the noble Lord, Lord Alton, for securing this debate, which has already been, as expected, a high quality one, with a focus both on dealing with the immediate crisis but also looking at broader issues. And there is absolutely no doubt that there is an immediate crisis, and it's essential that every string possible is pulled, every emergency step taken, to keep the hunger, the child stunting, the desperation and fear to a minimum in the Horn of Africa and East Africa and more broadly. But I'm going to mostly take what you might call a long jure view, as the noble Lord, Lord Alton, in his powerful and clear introduction to this debate, did also. For this crisis didn't start with the illegal Russian attack on Ukraine. It's a crisis with a long history, a history of centuries of destruction, of human knowledge, of ecosystems, of tens of millions of lives by a global political system that has concentrated wealth in the hands of a few in a few countries, by a narrow, ignorant scientific orthodoxy that has destroyed ecosystems and farming systems that operated successfully, sustainably, on principles that we would now call agroecological for millennia, a system that relied on terror and murder to enforce its inequalities, its starvation, as the British Empire did in India in the Great Famine of 1876 to 1878. That system has now clearly failed, with a long set of disasters predating the Russian invasion, as set out by the noble Lord, Lord Alton, disasters that include, but are far from limited to, the creation of the new geological age of the Anthropocene. In attempting to tackle the structural failures created by an extractive, exploitative political system, the world has concentrated, unsuccessfully again, on a few narrow aspects of human ingenuity and thought. There's been so little innovation in our mainstream economic, social or political thought that's been in the hands for decades of a neoliberal consensus that's dominated an extremely narrow band of what's been considered mainstream politics. That's even further concentrated financial resources in the hands of the few, frequently parked in extraordinarily unproductive pointless tax havens, robbed by a corruption that steals at least 5% of the world's global production. That's a figure from the International Monetary Fund, by the way. Now, the global Lord, Lord Hastings of Scarthbrook, spoke about food waste. That's a waste of 5% of the world's entire resources stolen. Collectively, those in power have shown enormous hubris in treating soil ecosystems of which we've had no understanding like inert substrates, in assuming that focusing on a handful of crops that now form the majority of human diets, that we'd be able to tackle whatever pests and diseases nature, with its hundreds of millions of years of biological development, would throw up, and that their military forces could continue to support despotic dictators, Colonel Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein being just two of the most frequent examples, but I've also been reading recently about the Dominican Republic dictator, Rafael Trujillo. Should an alien, being unfortunate enough to land on the island of Hispaniola today, blighted by centuries of colonialism and neocolonialism, they get a crash course in the nature of the world we've created, built on exploitation and inequality. And that exploitation and inequality and repression started close to home. I'm not sure how many noble lords know the history of why wheat became such a dominant crop. The aristocracy wanted to eat white bread. That was the posh thing. So peasants who wanted to grow a variety of crops were forced by feudal systems to grow wheat, which was a much more dangerous and risky crop rather than other alternatives. And we can see a parallel too in maize. That crop that came from the New World, where it was grown in ecological systems mixed with beans and squash, yet we've brought it here and with desperately bad human, animal and environmental impacts, grown it at huge expanse, uh, both to feed to animals and indeed to feed into our car engines. But that's all the past. 
We can't change it. What we have to do now is look to the future. And in the days, weeks and months ahead, we have to focus on getting people fed. We know some ways. We have seen, at least at a trial level, um, the institution of universal basic income to actually give people cash transfers that they can use to meet their own needs, to make their own choices, far, far better than imposing on them whatever food aid, often from our own resources, we think we can deliver to them. We, the government's uh, official development aid policies, already referred to by many speakers, um, have taken a disastrous direction, not just in slashing the volume of that ODA, but also in an explicit redirection towards our own trade interests. We can hope, and I know the noble Lord the Minister won't be able to make a commitment since we don't know what the new government will be like, but we can hope that it might take a different direction in the future. Now, thinking about what we need to do also is getting away from the hubris of the narrow areas of what we've called science. We need to draw on, develop, enhance, support traditional ways of producing food, traditional agricultural systems. And I'm just going to give one example of the kind of systems that are so essential to meeting our future food needs. There's a traditional practice in Niger known as Tassa. Farmers dig uh, small pits uniformly across a field to collect rainwater and place manure in the bottom of each pit to increase soil fertility. Seeds are then planted on the long ridges of each pit. In one trial with millet, a matching piece of land planted without the technique yielded 11 kilos of millet per hectare. 11 kilos. The tassa land yielded 553 kilos per hectare. Small-scale agriculture can and must provide a good, secure living with some essential prerequisites, including security of land tenure, with democratic local structures of input and information enabled among farmers, and crops being grown that are suited to the natural environment, that are diverse and resilient. We can start at home by supporting our own farmers to move fast towards agroecological systems, to feed ourselves, as work for the Centre for Alternative Technology has demonstrated is possible. What right do we have to rely on other people's soil and water and labour to feed ourselves? Sure, if they produce something extra special, tasty, attractive, spices or coffee, there's nothing wrong with swapping that for some of the things that uh, we produce that they want. But we shouldn't be taking essential staple foods and nutrients out of the mouths of others, particularly the world's poor. Now, it's rather a pity the noble Lord Lord Hammond's not in his place, because I do want to address uh, some of the points that he raised, um, starting with the, uh, the free trade deal with Australia. Now, noble lords may not know, but I suspect it will come up in a lot in our future debates about the fact that there's just been a major state of nature report come out in Australia. And it's a bit of a contest, but it's probably even worse than our state of nature reports. To quote, Australia lacks an adequate framework to manage its environment, close quote. And yet we're planning to take food from there. Now, the noble Lord, Lord Hannon, um, said the last place on earth to experience um, man-made famine uh, is North Korea. I'm not sure that he was actually listening to the noble Lord, Lord Alton's introduction with the very long list of famines being experienced in the world now and in the recent past. Relying on the market for food means the rich can get what they want, the people without money cannot. And relying on the market for food has not, since the 1990s, when most of these figures started, has left us with a world where about the lowest we've managed to get is 750 million people in the world regularly going to bed hungry. We've never done better, if that's the right word, than that. That is a failed model. The idea that we'll just ship this 
food round and round the world. And I think the uh, the noble bishop, the, noble, the right reverend bishop of St Albans, made a really important point about the sheer fragility of relying on global supply chains, which, of course, the situation in Ukraine only helps to highlight. Uh, now, I want to come to a final point and a direct question for the noble lord, the minister. I talked about small farmers needing land security. So I believe it's time that our government spoke out strongly against the transnational land agreements that are stealing the most basic resource, particularly of Africa, from peoples who are effectively powerless to resist. Can the noble lord, the minister, comment and perhaps update the figures that I have? Uh, these are figures from 2008, which say that Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, Abu Dhabi and eastern nations and this is a study from the Wilson Centre, controlled over 7.6 million cultivatable hectares overseas. I've got no doubt that figure has since grown. Now, I'm almost out of time, but, well, one sentence to finish. That transnational land ownership. In the Victorian era empire, British empire, men standing in this very chamber forced Indian soldiers, abused into submission by the vicious repression after the Great Rebellion, to guard trains that were taking away desperately needed food from their wives and children Sorry, to be shipped to these... That's a very long sentence. Will we tolerate the same thing happening in the 21st century? <laughs>